Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Catherine Bertini. I'm a distinguished fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you here today. Um, this session, a solution session called Building Africa's Capacity and Human Capital, is part, of course, of our 2017 Global Food Security Symposium, an expanded symposium because we're expanding now beyond the one-day jam-packed day tomorrow. And before we get started, the first order of business on behalf of the Council and all of us um, is to thank KL Gates for their support because they're providing this wonderful space for us today. And in particular, I I'd like to thank Samuel Lee, who is a partner of uh, KNL Gates based in Chicago and who is counsel to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and David Case, who is the managing partner here in the DC office. So thank you both very much. Also, I'd like to thank our partners for this discussion, Grow Africa and the African Leadership Network. Where are you? Thank you. Uh, and I want to acknowledge and uh, thank our next generation rapporteurs, Kelsey Bachenberg and Victor Floro. Where are you? Please. Thank you. So their job in this session is capture, to, to capture today's themes and outcomes, and we'll share them after the event. This discussion is on the record. Please feel free to use social media. We are live streaming this event. Our Twitter hashtag is... Hmm? What's the sign? Hashtag, thank you. All it has is that thing. Uh, hashtag global ag. I tweet, by the way. Uh, and our Twitter, Twitter, Twitter handle is at global ag dev. Uh, please, though, do remember to silence your phones. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper, deeper global understanding and an active UN engagement in the world. We're really proud of our work, especially in agriculture development, which brings us here today because uh, not only has the Council been involved on the domestic level with agriculture policy, but also since 2008 with international agriculture development. And we, we're very proud of that work and we're proud to extend it to be able to include discussions like this one that we're having today. It's important for the Council that I make a disclaimer views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. We look forward now this afternoon for a lively conversation on how to attract and train Africa's next generation of leaders. In an increasingly global society where the demand for food is matched by a need for financial and human capital, how can the public and private sectors enable young people? Before we begin, also I'd like to explain the afternoon's format. As you can see from the agenda, we have a panel discussion with audience Q&A, then a flash talk, and then a short conversation and audience Q&A. Our first panel here assembled now includes Euler Brople, who is the founder and managing director of Vested World. Um, Paola Ramdi, an, invest, an investment director uh, at Investiture Partners. You can do better than that, I think, uh, than I can. Um, David Ruscio, who is the CEO of Farm Concern International. And Sharon Smickel, who is an independent journalist, and she will moderate this discussion. Uh, after this panel completes its work, we'll move on to the next. So please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Thank you, Catherine. I'm so pleased to join our panel and the audience for this important and timely discussion. I'm going to start by posing a question to each of the panelists, and, um, and then we'll move on to uh, more 
perhaps more interactive discussion. Um, so the question I'm going to start with is with David. My question is, David, um, how is the agriculture section emerging as an opportunity, not only for the next generation, but for the continent as a whole? Thank you, Asha. Uh, my name is David, as sorry introduced. Well, I, I think those of you who have an interaction with Africa, you know Africa is not a country, Africa is many countries with different contexts, um, right from the Maghreb, the Mediterranean Sea, to the Sub-Saharan Africa, and down to the South. And there is, however, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a very dominant trend. Africa is also very agricultural. Um, our people in Africa have always been growing crop, and it's, it's a place we, we find it in our culture, in our song, in our everything. So agriculture is the main thing among the African people. And that has been so for generations. However, this is also a continent of about a billion people. And uh, agriculture is still uh, grossly underinvested. The investment that goes towards agriculture is limited. And you may want to know that 6% is only 94% of African agriculture is rain-fed. We grow on open sun, and that's it only 6% is under irrigated agriculture. That demonstrates a very significant underinvestment. Under it's also important to appreciate that uh, most of the uh, farmers in Africa are small order, subsistent farmers who have always grown crop without the appreciating the science of crop breeding, the science of, um, of um, mechanization and technology, and so on, and therefore, Africa remains to be having quite a potential ability to, to, to grow forward, but with very limited um, uh, chance of doing it because of low investment. But all is not human group. There is emerging opportunity to invest in African agriculture uh, that is intentional, that can be able to build. Um, the market is enormous. We import arguably about 50 billion US dollar worth of food annually, and that gives an opportunity for investors to invest in African agriculture that has a local market within African continent. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Euler, you changed careers to devote your time and attention to invest in emerging African businesses. What kinds of entrepreneurs or businesses attract you, and what gaps do you see? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so I think makes sense to start with the gaps. Uh, one of the things we recognize was there is a huge gap, as David said, in financing available to entrepreneurs <coughs> in these markets. So Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Southeast Asia and Latin America. And so what I really wanted to try to address was how do you bridge that gap between microfinance and what banks and traditional investors are willing to do. So there's this gap between $100,000 and somewhere around $2.5 million. And so that's the gap we really wanted to address. The other gaps uh, that we really started to focus on more and more is import substitution. As, as David said, uh, the continent imports up to more than $50 billion worth of, of product that they consume each year. And that's a huge market opportunity. If you can supply uh, food to people and sell it to them, at fair prices, that's a huge economic opportunity that we wanted to capitalize on. Um, the other is value-added post-harvest processing. So Africa exports a lot of raw commodities that and don't add a lot of value to it. A great example is in the cocoa industry where West Africa grows close to 70% of the world's cocoa but only gets 2% of the value in that industry. So those are the gaps that we wanted to, to address. Um, as far as what we look for in entrepreneurs, they need to be in the right geography <laughs> where we're investing. So we focus on Anglophone countries primarily. Um, and they need to be in the right industry. So agribusiness, consumer products, and what we call enabling technology. So to what, what extent can someone in ag or uh, consumer products leverage technology to be more efficient or scale their business faster? And then the entrepreneur, that's kind of the most important thing that we look for. Um, those people need to be passionate about what they're doing. Um, they need to have a 
realistic vision of what they can achieve. Um, they need to be flexible, not really stuck in their ways and willing to take advice where it's appropriate. Um, and they have to have integrity. Um, we're investing at a stage where a lot of things can go wrong and we need to trust the people that we're investing in because uh, they're their day-to-day -day running the businesses. And so those are the key things that we, we look for. Thank you. Paula, you come from a more mature social impact fund established in 2002. How can an impact investor add value to a small or medium-sized enterprise? Thank you, Sharon, for the question. I work uh, for Investisseur et Partenaire, which is uh, an impact investment fund based in uh, Paris, in France, but with the um, offices in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the way we, we see the value add that we can have in SMEs can be summarized in three main points. The first one is that uh, those entrepreneurs that we are financing, they are not only uh, looking for money, they are also looking for uh, people to partner with uh, because those entrepreneurs, they find themselves uh, most of the time alone when it comes to take some uh, big decision like finance decision or marketing decisions. So uh, we play the role of uh, counselor and advisor to those uh, people. The second value add that we can have is that uh, usually as an impact investment uh, fund that is different from the commercial um, funds, we have a technical assistance facility that we can use to, uh, for training or for capacity building. And the third uh, value add that for me is uh, the most important is that when uh, we invest in companies, we ask them, uh, we take into account three um, investment criteria. So when we invest in them, we ask them uh, for a minimum of um, reporting. Also, we ask them for audited financial statements and we may ask also for both seats. So all of these encourage the SMEs to be uh, more organized, more structured, and uh, have a better governance. Thank you. Our next round of questions will be posed to the entire panel, so now I think we can get a conversation going. Um, the first question is, are you seeing examples of governments enacting <coughs> policies intended to integrate young people into the agriculture and food sectors? How is that happening, and are those policies effective? So I'll let you. Well, Anyone here? Well, again, I must point out here that uh, unlike the other parts of the world, Africa is having a, a population that is becoming younger and younger in average. When we are worrying about aging population in Europe and in Japan and so, in Africa, we're getting younger and younger to the point that some countries will be having an average age of 25, 18, 18 25. That, that's a big deal because we have a big group of young people. However, um, as I talk about government, it's important to note that unemployment among young people is a big challenge and that poses a very, a very unprecedented challenge to governments of, of Africa. Um, and, and, and that's important to note because if you have unemployed youth, then you have an opportunity to join criminal gangs, to join terror groups, ATC, in, in very fragile states. That's where terrorism is right. And, and, and that, again, governments of Africa are not rich. They are fragile. They are delicate. There are many that are trying to do policies that are reflective of that new, or rather that very crucial, crucial challenge. One, for example, in the government of Kenya in East Africa, where 30% of all government business will be done, it's a policy. If you are procuring goods, you've got to have 30% allocated to, to, to the youth as defined by the AU. And that seems to be bringing some, some enthusiasm among youth. But I, I, must, I must stress here that um, the, the, the youth of Africa are not being included in the development we, we, we really are seeing. The growth of GDP in, in Africa is impressive but it's not very inclusive. Where I work in Farm Concern International, we have endeavored to develop each community through a business monitoring we call the commercial villages that integrates youth into business, making clear that the opportunities for the youth are safeguarded and availed to youth people, because in doing so, then you stem the possibility of very fragile communities that have youth that can go to criminality or, or even the worst deal, as you know, 
the emerging challenge of terrorism. And I think that's one. Number two, uh, many, many, many states are coming, many governments in Africa are coming to understand that you can invest in infrastructure and in industry and so on, but if you do not really isolate very intentionally uh, investment that targets ability to integrate youth in the economic mainstay, then you're going to have very unstable states in subsequently. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's an emerging discussion, and as you know, in the, in the AU and other forums, in the African Development Bank, they have a determination and a focus to have a, an agenda to get youth in mainstream business so that you can use an employment. We generate, we, we have about 12 million in Africa of youth that come out in looking for jobs in training institutions, employable people. But Africa generates about 3, 3, 3, 000, 3 million to 4 million jobs every year. That gap uh, ought to be bridged. I think there is a need for concerted understanding and, and focus to, to integrate youth into employment and into invest, investment that do generate them opportunities. And that's what we hope can be a debate for today as well. Okay. I, it seems like governments are, are trying to do more and more now. Um, I just came back from Rwanda uh, earlier this week, we're on in Kenya, and in Rwanda met with the Minister of Youth and they are now putting together a formal program where they're bringing people from Singapore um, and other developed world countries uh, to meet with youth who are interested in uh, opportunities within ag and ICT and the, the intersection of those two industries. And, and so that's, that's encouraging. Um, the reason I was there was a program uh, between the UN and um, the Indian government uh, called CETA and where they were bringing together a group of women entrepreneurs to teach them about the industry, more about the industries that they're in, how do they export if they, if they have businesses in that sector, um, how do they attract financing, and those types of programs are, are encouraging to see. But it seems like one of the, the biggest gaps remains um, the, the, the financing element of it, and also to some extent know-how about how to operate within an environment where there are you know, going to be challenges and obstacles that you encounter, whether it's regulatory, uh, whether it's, it's trade barriers, uh, whether it's access to finance. And so there needs to be more done. Um, various people are trying to address this in, in different ways, but I think there's a lot more we can continue to do to, to, to help encourage more youth to, to pursue opportunities in agriculture and show them that it can be both rewarding personally and lucrative for them if they do that. What about sort of on the ground practical policies, seed certification for example, and that sort of thing. If you have those consumer protections, if you will, in place, does that help reassure young people that this is a stable career that, uh, that would be supported by extension and the infrastructure that's needed, you said? It, from what I've seen, there, there needs to be more work done uh, from that point of view. Um, I know organizations like AGRA mm -hmm. are working hard with the government um, with respect to seed certification uh, specifically. Uh, we're now looking at a deal, uh, David and I were talking about this earlier, and where it's uh, uh, veterinary services and vaccines for animals, and the government, again, controls what's allowed in that market. And so there's some concern from that business about what risks there are if they develop a product. Is it going to be allowed in the country? Will they be able to sell it? Can they project it to the future how long they can sell this product without any, any interventions from the government? So it is an issue that still needs to be resolved. How do you have thoughts on this question? Um, actually, uh, I would like to take an example of Morocco about the enacting policies and give uh, some concrete uh, examples of uh, what uh, government can do. So uh, agriculture in Morocco is very key uh, for the economy. It employs more than 37% of the workforce and contributes only uh, for less than 20% in the GDP. And um, the government has adopted uh, what we call the um, Green Morocco Plan which has started in 2008, will finish by 2020. And this uh, plan aims at increasing the yields of um, the agriculture and also um, to encourage more farmers to uh, shift toward crops 
and um, agriculture that is uh, that has market demand. Uh, so uh, the policy that uh, it's implementing to attract more uh, young, more youth to uh, to agriculture is um, is uh, providing uh, subsidies to the equipment, especially to uh, irrigation equipment because uh, water is key for agriculture. And for example, in Morocco, less than 20% of the Arab lands are equipped with irrigation. So these subsidies are very uh, important and they are uh, can vary between 80% and 100%. Uh, and this specific measure attracts a lot of uh, entrepreneurs to the agriculture sector. And this plan is subsidized by uh, many governments and also by uh, the World Bank, for example. Yeah, maybe maybe on, on the same front, I think it's important to know that uh, the, 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 the youth in Sub-Saharan Africa particularly are not the youth we had in the 80s and the 90s. They are very switched on youth, they are globalized in thinking, and they can uptake the challenges that are a little bit globalized. However, it's important to note that um, any opportunity given to the youth of Africa um, must be really deliberate. It's, it's, it's not, not it being open for them to fight it out with the rest. And, and I'm talking about um, artisan level, uh, being AI assistants, being um, able to do extension, and so on. Uh, the truth is, because of the poverty that has been in the past, Yes, there was a view to look at agriculture like an option for not having something great to do, and that's the farming and the, and the farm. But at the moment, I think that, that change ought to take place by having deliberate programs that do, in, do take, take up youth into opportunities of, uh, of business and employment within the agricultural sector. At, at that certain level, even, uh, even, and I'm saying that because there's a need to encourage a more scholarly approach to agriculture, studying a degree and, and beyond, which is excellent, but that's not where the majority of the youth are. They need to be given opportunity at, 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 the, at, at the lower level where they can be able to engage in agriculture, and that, that needs to be deliberate and targeted by investors, and any, any social investor or change agent in, in, in Southern Africa, I think. Thank you. We'll move on to another question, but we could, we could spend the rest of our time on that one. <laughs> um, formal education and training opportunities of different types are incredibly important to supporting young people in their bids to seize, up, to seize opportunities. Um, what are some of the most effective approaches or programs you've seen deployed in efforts to attract young people to agribusiness? Which are the, what are the effective ones? I will continue with the Moroccan case. Okay. <laughs> so in Morocco, uh, the, the training uh, in agriculture is part of this uh, Green Morocco Plan. Um, and uh, this education system is based on three main pillars. The first one is the high uh, education in agriculture. In Morocco, we have uh, three uh, institutes that uh, train the future engineers. Um, there is also the technical um, agriculture training, which is um, provided in more than 45 uh, institutes that are spread out in the whole country. And uh, there is more than 2,600 uh, people that benefit from this uh, training. And uh, this technical uh, training can be can start also at the high school level, especially for high schools that are um, in the rural areas. And the third part, which is very important, is uh, the apprenticeship. Uh, this apprenticeship aims at uh, attracting the people that are the young people that are uh, dropped out from school, because it's a very big phenomenon in uh, rural areas in Morocco. So, with this apprenticeship, the the, the, the aim is to uh, attract those people to the workforce, or to prepare them to uh, to run farms uh, that were already run by their parents. Uh, and this apprenticeship benefits from uh, benefits to more than ten thousand young uh, girls and boys every year. Interesting. Some of the programs uh, we've seen and uh, have, been, have been fortunate enough to be involved with, uh, one is uh, it's not directly related to ag training, uh, but it's related to 
business training. It's uh, Stanford University has a program called SEED, and they have campuses set up both in uh, Nairobi and in, in Accra, Ghana, where they, they teach young entrepreneurs um, really fundamentals on how to manage and run their businesses. And professors from Stanford visit with these entrepreneurs over the course of a six month period. And then um, they have coaches that are assigned to work with them to implement the things that they learn during those sessions. So that's that's an extremely great program that, that Stanford's running. Um, another uh, that we've seen and are starting to work with is a program that's a partnership between a, a number of global food businesses. So it's called Partners in Food Solutions. Uh, and it's a partnership between Cargill, General Mills, Hershey's, Bueller, getting one, I'm sure. Um, but they allow uh, members from there but within the companies to work with entrepreneurs in developing countries with various technical aspects of their businesses. Um, so that's a really effective tool for helping uh, share technical knowledge on anything from food processing, um, to packaging, distribution, um, and things like that. One of the, I think, to step back a little bit, that the whole debate between formal education and, and whether it's more informal or vocational training I think to put things in perspective, uh, when you, I like to compare Asia's development with, with Africa's development. And when you look at countries in Asia, countries like South Korea and Taiwan, um, at the start of its development, so in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when you look at literacy rates in South Korea and Taiwan, I think in South Korea it was less than 45%. In, in Taiwan it was around 50%. And those countries' literacy rates, if we're going to use literacy rates as a measure for how educated the population is, um, didn't really start to take off until those countries that are, were well on their, their path towards developing. And so there's an argument to be made that formal education really isn't the answer to addressing the problem. Maybe controversial, but there's some, some indicators to, 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 to say that. Um, what was more important was vocational training and, and teaching specific skills related to the industries that those countries were trying to develop. And so each of those countries, it was agriculture and manufacturing. And so I think there's an argument to be made that vocational training is a much more effective tool uh, for helping address some of the issues in, in African countries. Perhaps uh, thank you to you for that. The government of Ethiopia, in partnership with the Canadian <coughs> Minister of Foreign Affairs, has a campaign to equip the technical vocational institutions in agriculture and to be able to hold young people to begin agricultural enterprises. And I think that's very remarkable. One of the ways they do it is to expose them in the region within Eastern and Southern Africa to expose um, both the trainers and uh, in ways they can be able to benefit from other examples of where, where such has been done. Where I work, Farm Concern International has been a partner to expose the trainers in order to uphold youth in Africa. I think that's very remarkable. In, in Tanzania, the government of Tanzania, and some and with, with assistance or partnership with, with other organizations, there is an ongoing ability to, uh, to have an incubation for agricultural enterprises that are run by young people. I think the, 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 that thinking that Yura has underscored of um, vocational level being the emphasis is, uh, is, is what will unlock agricultural potential in, in Africa because the youth who are growing in doubts and doubts are really needing that level of education for them to, to get into enterprise. And I think there are many, every government is trying to do it in a smaller way. Perhaps the best would be to mobilize everyone to help the African government and people to focus on that level of the youth in, in handholding young people to get into agricultural enterprises. Many young people I've met in both East and West Africa are living in the cities, but they feel connected to the countryside yeah. because typically their homes were in the countryside. Yeah. Is, is, there, is it possible to lure them back? to the countryside or maybe maybe at least to engage them in enterprises that involve the output of the countryside. Yeah, Africa is made of villages. Everyone comes from some village somewhere. Yeah. 
perhaps there are very few people who really call the towns their home. They always return back for festivals, for marriages, and so on. And the reason why people, the, unlike the, the, the European Industrial Revolution that pulled workers to town, there are no industries that are growing that rapidly in African cities. So they just go to look for opportunities that are not there. So you grow up slums. Uh, you may want to know the slum, if you're living in African cities, is poorer than the rural countryside. And so the only reason why they go to towns is because of lack of opportunity to engage in economic activities. If we were to engage in building enterprises, ability to connect them to the, to the market, opening up uh, areas for economic development, then there will be a, a migration plan to the rural countryside. And that's happening in many of the African countries where there is an attempt to do that. You are absolutely right that uh, there is always a, a need to finish school so that you can hop to the next bus to go to town to look for opportunities, because that's how we are taught. Um, maybe to just make a statement, uh, when the British and the French ruled African countries, we, they, they were we were taught that if you want to be successful, you've got to finish school, go to town, get a white collar job, and be successful. Now, of course, that is, as we all know, that, uh, that has been overtaken by time. But without opportunities in the rural countryside, with the poverty in the rural countryside, we continue getting uh, towns crowded by people looking for opportunities. Maybe uh, I think, and you guys, right, a time has come when if we were able to build targeted opportunities that are deliberate by investors, by social, governmental, and otherwise, bilateral, multilateral, that target youth in their rural countryside. It will open up economies, and there will be a migration back to the rural countryside, I believe, and that does seem to be happening in some instances. That sort of loops back to what Euler was talking about in terms of vocational training. That's correct. Um, I think we have time for one more question before we take questions from the audience. And the one that I'm going to ask is one that David especially has already spoken to. But it's important enough in these times that I think we'll conclude this part of the conversation um, with this question. The youth bulge often is talked about as an impending threat. But another perspective is to see this new generation as the fuel for development. As three people deeply involved in building businesses that will support food security in the coming decades. What is your perspective on this debate? Is the youth bulge <coughs> any threat, or is it a new opportunity for us? I, I, I think it can go either way in the next. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, I, I tend to be a glass half full kind of guy, so I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity, um, and we need to capitalize on it. Again, I mean, when you look at a lot of these countries, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of the population is engaged in agriculture. Even though literacy rates, I mean, in a country like Kenya, I think literacy is 79 percent. Um, that's probably on the higher side yeah. in, in, in Africa. Zimbabwe may be pretty, maybe higher. Oh, yeah. um, uh, Nigeria is around 59 percent. Uh, Ethiopia is probably around 45 yeah. percent or so. So populations moderately educated, if you want to say that. Um, but people, uh, what we've seen a lot, um, a lot of from, from where I sit, where money's going, money is going to the wrong things. Money is going into a lot of technology where it's, it's a solution looking for a problem. The problem is there are a large number of people in these countries, 70%, who are in a particular industry, agriculture, and agriculture is getting a very small percentage of the capital flowing into these countries. And so if, if we want this to truly be an opportunity, if we want to realize the demographic dividend, I think more capital needs to be flowing into the parts of the economy that need it the most in, in these countries is agriculture and its manufacturing. And tie that place to the youth bulge. How do you play with the youth bulge? So in most African countries, more than 50% of the population is below 25%, 25 years, years of age. That's correct. Um, those people are, are in kind of a, physically speaking, they're the strongest that they're, they're going to be. Um, and as we all know, ag and manufacturing is extremely labor intensive. 
someone who's older, it's going to be a lot harder for their body to, to endure that level of work, unfortunately, for the, the amount of time and period that it would be required. And so these younger people are much more able to bear that kind of work. And I'm not saying people should be doing hard physical labor all day, every day. There are ways you can mechanize uh, agriculture. There's ways to mechanize um, manufacturing to make it less labor intensive. But you have a workforce that's eager, that's able, and willing to do this. And you can take advantage of that um, in order to lift these countries up to take advantage of the amount of young people you have available uh, for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any thoughts to add to that? I think uh, that uh, if those young people are ignored by their governments, they can be a threat. But uh, if, they if they are attract enough uh, attention from their governments, so if the government use the appropriate policy to take care of this uh, demographic changes, uh, they can be a real uh, fuel for the future de development because they are representing the future workforce and the future entrepreneurs at the same time. So as future workforce, this workforce needs to be trained and this workforce needs to, to have the appropriate training that is adapted to the market needs. And as entrepreneurs, they need to find uh, an entrepreneurship environment that is encouraging for them. That means with uh, less bureaucracy, more uh, justice, and um, with uh, more infrastructure too. Uh, so uh, if the government uh, implement the right uh, policies uh, to uh, create more uh, jobs, um, this uh, youth can be the real fuel for the future. One thing, one thing that seems, oh, go ahead. Yeah, perhaps it's important to know the threat is not just for those for those countries, but it's for, for the entire globe. When when um, the world kept not very engaged on a fragile state called Somalia, uh, continued on until the youth grew who never went to school and produced uh, a hub of pirates and stopped a very international maritime highway from operating, and then the world moved in. And solved it. So the problem of youth can be a big threat, and it's important for investors and others, and, and governments and all, to be mobilized towards uh, investing in programs that can make the the demographic dividend an opportunity for the African people. Otherwise, it can become a reason for the world to be much more worried in the days to come, especially because. If you don't harness the youth bulge in productive work, then there will be flat out states that can become a problem to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time for the well, it's usually the live based part of the program, and that is questions from the audience. <coughs> and so I'm going really to ask you to put your question. Please identify yourselves, and we won't be handing you on microphones, but um, I will repeat your question to make sure that everyone on both sides of the room can we hear what we're talking about? Um, and so I think if you just raise your hands or stand to ask a question, that would be good. Well, then I feel obliged. All uh, right. <laughs> Bob Castro with the Secretary of State's Office of Global Partnerships. Uh, part of the lead in was talking about innovative partnerships. A lot of what I heard is sort of new thinking, but um, I'd really love to hear if each of you has an example of something, a, a part, a public-private partnership that's not being done the traditional way. Uh, and particularly since you talked about education and vocational training, opportunities where the government can be a catalyst or a lever, but not either primarily funder or um, doing what is inherently governmental, which is the government-to-government -government regulatory and those sorts of things. So the question is about, um, to ask the panelists to talk, comment on, about innovative public-private partnerships that are not being done in the traditional way, correct? Please, any volunteers? I, I, I think so much is being done that we don't know about and it's not really well publicized and, and you've got to dig within the annals of 
the government and everything that they're doing to, to really understand how it, there was a program I learned about a couple of years ago and I haven't really seen much of it. I think it's called Lions um, uh, under, his, under the State Department or under um, USAID, I can't recall exactly, but I, based on my understanding, the idea was that companies in the U.S. would be working directly with entrepreneurs and early stage businesses in developing countries, uh, sharing this technical knowledge, similar to the Partners in Food Solutions program that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. I think that is, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. What we're seeing is, as consume, especially in the consumer packaged goods area, as these companies start to look at Africa as a growth market, they want to establish a footprint there. Um, typically, some companies have tried and, and failed uh, for various reasons. Uh, the ones that are approaching this in the right way are looking at businesses that are already operational on the ground and acquiring them. And typically, they're paying very high multiples for those businesses. And they could, I, well, I think they could um, make a much better business case for first assisting businesses that are already on the ground, uh, gain the, the knowledge and know-how of how to operate within that sector, uh, whether it's, it's sourcing from the right way, uh, producing your products, getting into market effectively, um, figure out which segment of the market you want to attract before they then go in and acquire those businesses. I think uh, <coughs> companies like Kellogg and um, Procter & Gamble um, Unilever, who are all looking at these markets as, as expansion opportunities, could benefit greatly from providing that technical skills to entrepreneurs in these markets first, and then as they scale up, can then um, enter in either form, form joint ventures uh, or acquire them outright. And there's, there's an opportunity that will pay dividends commercially, uh, but it also does a lot of good with respect to building up these economies, employing people, paying them fair wages. Perhaps, uh, perhaps an example, uh, the government of Kenya and Farm Concern International, where I work, <coughs> supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, have a program we call Youth in Agriculture and Trade Enterprises, where we, we work with high school students to promote the understanding of agricultural enterprises as an opportunity of after school. Um, you may appreciate that uh, universities are not many and the opportunities for Kenyan young people to proceed to university is pretty less than 10% for those in high schools. Now where do those others go? They go looking for work wherever. Now we need, we need to promote agriculture as being cool and an option for career at vocational level. And uh, that is done innovatively. You see games, for example, sponsoring um, tournaments that are provincial and then making the opportunity for women to promote agriculture as a direction to take as, as, as an opportunity. And that's why FCI is in, in, the, in the game. In the same, we also promote champions across the country who are succeeding in, in, in being successful business people in agriculture, whether it's in production or value addition and others. And that seems to awaken the, the, the sense of, yeah, you can branch into investment in the villages. I want to emphasize again, the problem lies in us investing uh, in a way that the youth back in the village can engage in agricultural enterprise there where they are, rather than them expecting it. The other thing is also the need for, for real training that is practical, you know, um, ability to build um, an enterprise in, in agricultural sector ain't that easy because of the various variables within it. And uh, we have a, a program we call African School of Agribusiness which is to promote ability to understand the step A, B, C, D of running an enterprise, whether at farm level, or distribution level, validation level, whichever level. You need to get people who are potentially wanting to get into it to understand it practically, because business is business, and it's not easy. Now, I may want to say, perhaps in a, in a final way, that it's also important to know that uh, investment, where return on investment is very guiding, can really bypass agricultural enterprises because they are risky, they are not very attractive in many ways. Perhaps they need to have guarantees uh, for investing in agriculture, which uh, can open opportunity for employment as well as uh, be able to... Do and, and that kind of guarantee fund, for to borrow or to acquire machinery or to 
technology and data is something we, we think ought to be encouraged. There is for for credit, and I'm slightly pushed it to opening up agricultural sector investment. Colin, in the sense partnerships are your business, um, do you have anything that you want to add to this? No, nothing else uh, to add. Most of the partnerships that I've seen until now uh, work working appropriately. And uh, the main things that uh, I see is that when we have, for example, a technical assistance or a facility or something like that, it's, uh, we use it for a certain period of time. And the follow-up after when the funds are used, we can ask questions about how effective it is. How effective it will be for the next uh, decades or the next generations. Okay. We have a hand up over here. Yes. Please. My name is Quentin Gray, and I'm uh, actually a private consultant. And I have a comment and I have a question. The first comment is I heard all of what you said earlier, and I, did, and I know about the history of U.S. agriculture. Uh, I have a great knowledge. And everything you said. Have experienced in the United States. Some of the, the, the people leaving the farms, coming to the cities, etc. Uh, all of those things we have experienced. But what I wanted to comment on is concerning the public private sector partnerships. And that's what we call it in the United States. Because we don't have that public sector work together. In some fields, it might not matter as much. But in agriculture, we don't make progress unless they both work together. And then to make a comment about the youth and, and what is really going to make the difference at the end of the day. If they can sell the product and make the product. And so my question is, what have you seen on the African continent in helping the youth and even farmers in general get their product to the market where it has profitable uh, profit uh, levels? The question is, um, what have you seen um, that will help farmers get their products to market. Is that accurate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please expand. Yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, that one of the one of the the action that was made by some uh, that are implemented by some countries. Uh, to help the farmers uh, to get their products to, to the market is what we call the tripartite uh, uh, contracting between the farmers, the processors, and the banks. So um, some some countries and governments play a role to implement that kind of uh, of uh, partnership between the three uh, the, these three bodies, and um, it helps a lot. Uh, for the farmers to access financing, and when they access financing, they can uh, have harvest. And since they have this contracting with the processors, their products can be bought with a predetermined price almost, and they are sure that, that they will have clients for all their harvests. So I think this is one of the most effective uh, measures. Well, uh, thank you for for the comment. Objectively stated, we we work in Farm Concern International with a model we call the commercial villages model. We aggregate farmers into villages that are pre-existing, and those villages include the younger population and all members of the community. And we get them to understand their business of whichever value chain they are involved in. And then we bring in buyers from across the markets, whichever markets and get them to understand what the buyer or the, the buyer, the, the private sector expects in terms of volumes, in terms of quality, in terms of type, and then get to challenge the smallholder farmers to invest their money, their own money, into meeting what the private sector guy wants, because in that way they'll get the particular value already promised. Because they are gathered in a village that was pre-existing, they have reason to trust each other, and therefore the members of society that are exposed become leaders in, 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 in offering advice and negotiation. In the end, and in our 13 years of work, villages become deal makers, and they get to understand private sector expectations, and they cash on it. It's a journey. It doesn't happen in a day, because as you know, 
suspicion is rife, and every people in the village thinks businessmen are thieves, they want to steal our money, and they're not paying the right price. In the same way, private sector cannot use their money to come and organize more older farmers. It's very expensive, doesn't make business value. But as you organize more older farmers into commercial villages, as we call it, and that they become attractive to buyers who come in and offer, offer premium price because the, the aggregation costs has been resolved, the quality assurance has been resolved, and the numbers are adding up. That does work in our experience. Yeah, there's a, a couple of examples we've seen. So Sorry. Just, last, just last week, um, this partnership between the United Nations, East African governments, and in the Indian government um, the Indian, uh, there's an Indian um, spices company that has agreed to buy uh, chilies from smallholder farmers throughout East Africa. And so someone's aggregating the chilies from these farmers and selling it to the spice company and they're paying fair market prices for it. So that's a great example for how a, a, a farmer uh, can see where their, their products are going to be going, who's buying it, and what price they're going to get paid for it. Um, Two of the companies we've invested in are are working hard to to pay farmers fair prices for their their products. So one is a company called Moringa Connect uh, that works with farmers in Ghana who are growing moringa trees and buying the leaves and the seeds from them at fair market prices, processing those into oil and powder that's used. The powder is used in um, uh, as a nutritional supplement uh, for food fortification, and then the oil is used in cosmetic products and selling that to international buyers who are then incorporating those in, in their products, paying those farmers on average $1,200 to $2,000 a year, more income than they would otherwise get. Um, another is uh, a tomato processing company that's now working with uh, smallholder farmers in Nigeria to help them increase their yield so that they can meet uh, the global global average, meet and exceed the global average, and buy their tomatoes and process it into tomato paste. And then the last one is a, a company in Kenya that, uh, this was fascinating when I heard it, but when you go to the grocery store here in the US, a, a banana costs about 49, 50 cents um, a pound. In Kenya, if you went to an informal retailer the, or a grocery store, the banana cost probably 20 cents more. And, yeah, really. And why is that? There are several middlemen within that value chain. Yeah. And so they're buying the banana from the farmer on average for about eight to 10 cents a pound. And then every step of the way, they add their rent to it um, and end up selling it uh, to the grocery store. And the grocery store needs to earn, or the retailer needs to earn their margin. And so the farmer is losing about 50 cents in that transaction. So how do you cut the the, in the logistics chain, how do you cut all those middlemen out and reduce the amount of players in, in the space between the farmer and the end retailer? And there's a company that's, that's taken a really innovative approach to that um, and paying farmers on average double what they would get paid uh, from, a, from a broker and selling it to the retailers for less than what they would pay um, and then capturing the value. <coughs> the so there are people trying to address, address that exact problem and, allow the farmers to earn more for what they're growing. Thank you, Yola. We have time for one more question. And <coughs> I think we have, we'll take one from this side. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, my name is Isaac Diallo, and I'm from Zambia. I want to pick up on one of the speakers when he talked about the youth from yesterday being very difficult. <coughs> Because the typical case of the farmer in Africa has not changed much. <coughs> what the young people they have changed. They're more savvy now. They're more innovative. Yeah. Whether formally educated or not, <coughs> they yes. have access to so much technology that yeah. is happening around the world. And as such, we can get them <coughs> by talking about training, by talking about a whole lot of stuff that we're talking about now. All that is important. But you have to think about a dollar, the euro, the dollar, or whatever currency. They have to see the profit <coughs> in the activity itself. And as long as they see agriculture, the case of agriculture, as the poor farmer in the community they left behind, they are not going to go back to agriculture. That's 
that's right. So we need to define agriculture. Because when we talk about agriculture today, we're focusing on food production. Yeah. We're focusing on using all your energy to till the land, etc. Et we need to define agriculture. Where is agriculture today? We have so many problems in Africa. How do we have a conversation with the youth to get them engaged to be innovative? We have my nutrient deficiencies. How can we talk to them? How can we have a conversation with the young people? These are the problems. And we know that we have solutions in Africa. How can we engage? And coming from West Africa, we talked about Somalia and Cyrus. We have another problem. Where are our young men? They live, <coughs> they're going to the back way to Italy, etc., etc. And most of them are dying. Yeah. Right? I read an article, a newspaper article, where the woman in one of the communities in the Gambia was talking about that all the young men from that particular community have left. So if you want to get young men to stay in the rural communities, it has to be with rural development. They have to have a reason to stay, not where they are. Thank you so um, what we're talking about here is, is the fact that we still have farmers working in very traditional ways, but we have young people who are looking for something more. And there are other forces that are, that are attracting the young people. And, um, and we have to, have to have rural development in order to make this work. Do any of you have any thoughts you want to add to that? And we have about two minutes left. I think your passion is, is, is common to all of us except that the answers are not easy and uh, we need to look for those answers. Uh, it is true that uh, in, <coughs> in the Mediterranean, our, our 3,500 young children die trying to cross at Lampedusa to eat tree and to go and look for work and that's pathetic and um, we need to get them to work back home. That's why I repeat my statement that we need to make opportunities available back in the rural areas for them not to go to town and be enticed to go to treacherous trips like crossing the Mediterranean. <coughs> Excuse me. But I want to say also that that needs to be fairly uh, choreographed. The way to undo that needs to be choreographed. It is true that um, our youth may not, the, the average, average age of a farmer in sub-Saharan Africa is about 60 years because, because really no one does it thoroughly. However, a re rediscovering agriculture that is cool to young people is not difficult. It needs to be focused upon so that that does happen. Of course, there is those that can appreciate the ICT and the daily day. I was working with a, <coughs> with a young lady in the slums of Nairobi who was doing fish fingers that she sells through the internet in Michigan. <laughs> and, and, and she would get buyers and send them. I think that is there. But that's a little of it. The bulk of the youth will need to have a concerted effort by all of us to ensure that there is ability to make an, an, an enterprise, an income, an employment back in the rural countryside otherwise. The problem in Lampedusa, in the Mediterranean, and, and the guns all over, and the terrorism, and, and so on, can easily be here for some while. I would also want to urge that <coughs> building a mechanism that targets to make sure that only available economic activity in rural Africa is uptaken by the youth is programmatic. It is investment, it's governmental, it's everybody's concern, here and away. And I think that's what I would urge us to keep thinking and looking for solutions. But there are opportunities, there are examples. Ira and my sister here has alluded to some that are emerging in different countries. I think following that would be a part that I would want to emphasize that we do follow. In where I work, in Farm Concern International, we keep looking for opportunity to build programs that target the youth. That is important. Can those of you who have decisions and ability to influence decision makers, next time there is some person wanting some funds from wherever you are to go to African people, do inquire whether that includes uptaking the youth into gainful employment at the rural countryside. 
because of opportunities. Ah, their food is eaten there, consumption is there, and so on. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. I will let you quickly wrap up. There, I think that finish. was a very good note okay. to end on. Okay, very good. I agree. Um, time has come to move on to another segment of this program. So I hope I'll ask you to join me in thanking our panel. appreciate the reference to bananas earlier. That's awesome. Thank you. you did, it's very rare that someone sets up your talk quite so nicely. Let me see if I can get this. Hit B to start. Okay. There we are. Great. Well, Thank you all very much for being here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, my name is Andrew Mack. I'm the principal of AM Global Consulting, which is an 11-year-old firm based here in Washington, uh, Washington that works with technology and partnerships to create solutions focused on the developing world. And as it turns out, I'm here to talk about bananas, um, the one in three that's produced by smallholder farmers. So we got three here. There's this is, I'm here to talk about the one in three that isn't being used, isn't being enjoyed by consumers. And specifically, I'm here to talk about a new approach to getting that banana to market, putting money, more money in the hands of small, far, small farmers and more food on the table of a hungry world uh, with a new farm-to-market ecosystem that we're calling Agrimovil. Does this one go? Great. Okay, so I'm sure you've all seen what I've seen. I've spent more than 30 years working in the Global South, and all around you see people like the smallholder farmer that is sitting there with the bicycle on the right. You see him pushing his cart, you see him pushing his bike, sitting by the side of the road with literally bags of goods, waiting for the goods to be picked up, all while the fruits of his labor, quite literally fruits in this case, are going bad before his eyes. It's not a trivial part of his world. According to the FAO, post-harvest loss some 30 to 50% of all of the all that he produces, one in three bananas, or equivalent to $150 billion a year around the world. So what's $150 billion between friends, you might ask? Well, in 2016, $150 billion is what Chevron took in. It's what AT&T made. It's the gross national income of Finland. It's a lot of money. The challenge is that the farmer, he needs to be more than a farmer. When it comes down to it, he needs also to be a transporter. He needs to be a banker and a broker. And he's trying to, trying to do all of this disconnected from markets. And that's simply inefficient. It's simply too difficult to do. Faza, can you do me a favor and hit these? Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. In a macro sense, there may be few problems this big around the world. Taken together, smallholder farms would be the largest employer on Earth. As a group, smallholder communities would be the largest nation on Earth, larger than China, larger than India. But our population isn't static. It's slated to grow to over 9 billion by, two, by 2050. While we are spending around $5 billion every year to, uh, uh, our estimates show to, to raise yield, yield is only half of the equation. We need to compete, complete the transaction and get the food profitably and quickly to market. 
We know that this lost revenue comes with real consequences. Think about it in terms of migration, in terms of food insecurity, in terms of health and political stability. We talked before about the idea of employment. We also know that as long as the incentives are not there for farmers, they're not going to invest in seed, they're not going to invest in, in fertilizer, and they're not going to invest in additional labor if they're losing this much of their crops. The hard work of production is done. The sticky point, really, when it comes down to it, is logistics. And that's what we plan to address with a new app-enabled platform that we're calling Agrimobile. So Agrimobile brings together three proven technologies. On-demand on transport, think like Uber Pool, but for crops, to facilitate the pickup and delivery of product. Cell phone banking, to help make secure transactions and, and, and agree on pricing. We talked before about the fact that so much of the pro product, production price is lost. Absolutely, if you are the person sitting at the side of the road waiting for transport that may or may not come by, you are a price taker. You don't want to be a price taker. You want to agree in advance. And the third piece, the, uh, one of the innovations is microinsurance. How can we limit risk in an environment where people don't know each other? How can we make it possible, not just for groups that have come together to, 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 to take advantage of this, but also people who haven't met before. And we can do this by creating microinsurance. At least as importantly is the data that's generated, data that can be used by governments to try to improve infrastructure, to try to improve security, as well as companies who need to reach these markets. The system will allow, allow farmers and transporters to find each other. This is the key, to arrange pickup and the terms of, transa terms of the transaction and to buy insurance if they want it with the goal of making it possible to pick up more food more efficiently and when it is freshest. Now we recognize that get, reaching a disparate group of farmers will be challenging. And it was mentioned in one of our earlier presentations. The good news is that there are an awful lot of people out there who stand to benefit, who have a real interest in working with us to capture this lost value. Think about co-ops who need to get more money in the hands of their members. Think about transporters who want to go out but, but don't know whether there will be goods that are available and, and how much, what the quality of the goods and what the quantity of the goods will be when they get there. Think about mobile operators and banks, helping them to get into rural markets and make money while building coverage. This is really crucial because they have, they have business models that are built around the cities. How are they going to make money in rural areas? And think about governments and donors and the amount of money that's currently being spent to try to reach and, and, and improve rural economies. We hope to partner with all of these groups and all of them have something to gain through Agrimobile. And we know that today's system is really inefficient. It isn't capturing the value, the hard work that today's farmers are putting out. We know that tomorrow's consumers will need even more food. They'll need better food. And today's way of getting to the market really just isn't getting the job done. Today we're missing one banana in three, but to feed tomorrow's market, we're going to need four bananas or more. By, providing, by combining proven technologies, we can improve the global farm-to-market uh, ecosystem and unlock this trapped value for farmers, for transporters, for consumers, and for others. That's our goal with Agrimobile. Thank you very much.
And maybe we can start with William and he asked him to talk go. a little bit about how governments are transforming how they handle policy, but also how they transform institutions in order to achieve this. We certainly know that a lot of uh, institutions in any country, uh, especially governmental institutions, are, are, are somewhat overly bureaucratic and maybe a little bit stodgy. So, um, tell us some of the good news stories about how some of this is changing as it relates to policy for agriculture. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, uh, thank you very much to the Chicago Council for having me on this. I feel very uh, honored to be on the panel uh, with such a distinguished uh, moderator and certainly such a distinguished panel, co-panel member as, uh, as Gebiza. Um, I think I'll answer your question in two parts. Uh, there, there is certainly good news, um, um, but there are also opportunities. I think the good news is that today uh, agriculture is on the agenda of policy makers and private sector as never before. Uh, today, you know, um, you have heads of state, uh, government leaders, uh, CEOs, all talking about the potential of agriculture and how important it is to get the policies right, to get the investments right, um, that, you know, even just 10 years ago just didn't exist, okay? So I think that's, that, that, that is certainly good news and, and, and we should applaud that. Secondly, I think for the first time, uh, about 13 years ago, uh, the, Comprehensive Afri the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, CADA, uh, was passed by the African Union Heads of State. Uh, three years ago, they reviewed the progress on CADA. Uh, and CADA is basically a set of principles, and it provides a framework for agricultural transformation in Africa that all African countries are invited to follow. And the good news is that uh, an African uh, agricultural status report that is published by AGRA on an annual basis in 2016 found that those countries that had subscribed to the CADAP principles early uh, were making more progress than the ones that hadn't. So for the first time Africa has a comprehensive plan, uh, a roadmap if you want to transform African agriculture and, and it works. I think uh, the opportunity is that um, not all the countries today, I think David made an excellent point, Africa is a continent made up of 55 countries uh, with different cultures, different levels of development, different economies, languages and, and so forth. So not all the countries are interpreting CADAP in the same way, not all of them have the capacity to, to uh, implement it in the same way. And so that remains a challenge. The uptake on CADAP is, is, is still slow, but we know that it works. Secondly, the issue of capacity continues to be a problem. I think, you know, uh, although if you talk to policymakers, and particularly the heads of state level, at the policy making level, you know, everybody is saying the right thing, everybody is saying how much they want to invest in agriculture, everybody is talking about is strengthening capacity and institutions, but if you go two levels down to the people who actually have to make this happen, you have huge challenges of capacity. You find, uh, that uh, people, there's, there's the challenge of capacity in, in a broad sense, so you don't even have enough people who have the knowledge, but also those who are there don't have the depth of knowledge that is required to bring, um, you know, the transformation that is required. And I think thirdly, uh, the enabling environment, you know, private sector investment is uh, something all governments want, and particularly in, in agriculture, all governments are asking today, how can I get more private sector investment? I've built roads, I've put in agripoles, I've done all these things, and yet the private sector still doesn't come. I think one thing that uh, everybody has to recognize, an enabling environment for the private sector is very important. It doesn't matter whether it's agriculture or industry or any other sector. If the enabling environment is not right, if private investors, particularly if they're foreign, cannot get their, their, uh, their, their, their capital out or their profits out, they're not going to come regardless of how good your infrastructure is. If your policies are not certain, uh, if there's policy uncertainty around foreign investment, around agriculture and what you can and cannot do, you know, your private investors are not going to come. Capital does not like uncertainty. And so some of those challenges uh, remain. I'll stop there and perhaps uh, wait for some more reactions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. 
she will come back to some of those issues uh, in, a, in a minute, but uh, Kavisa, if we can go to R&D for uh, a few minutes, and especially your uh, involvement in R&D over many uh, years. You've been doing your own work, your own research in Africa. You've also been involved in uh, groups like the Board of International Food and Agriculture Development and advising USAID, as well as many other organizations. So you've seen firsthand changes that might be being made in Africa in, with uh, state or national uh, research facilities. So can you tell us a little bit more about how um, the, it, how they have evolved in terms of providing better support for farmers and what still needs to be done in order to help to proper strengthen uh, national research operations to be in the proper state? Yeah, I, I uh, uh, echo the, the comments that have been made by, by, by William in terms of all the positive development that have taken place in general, economic growth and more and more opportunities, um, and particularly this incredible infrastructure development that have taken place in the continent, and we'd probably talk a little more even about um, expansion in higher education and the opportunities for the young that on the surface are there and emerging and yet because of some of the things that William had indicated and those opportunities have not been really realistic for a large number of people. Uh, but you know, going back to the specific question that you asked me, uh, I think significant gains have been made in, in, in a number of uh, uh, ways in, in in transforming African uh, agriculture. Um, um, but to engineer Africa's transformative agriculture, you don't only need these positive economic uh, development that have taken place in finances and capital, as you indicated, but, but you also need uh, new knowledge, uh, appropriate technologies, and innovations, and then, as William indicated, uh, making sure that we have the right policy environment, regulatory issues, to make sure these, these, pop these opportunities uh, have been realized. While significant gains have been made uh, in Africa since independence in the last 50 years, um, I continue to feel that Africa's human capital and institutional capacity have remained too rudimentary and inadequate to support the aspirational goal for the 21st century transformative agriculture that we would like to see. And that, you know, if I'm lamenting the, the, the point that have been made over and over again, but that not having human capacity development taking place in the manner it needs to be and strengthening institution in Africa continues to be a tremendous bottleneck. One, um, just focusing on human capital, that the lack of wisdom to strategically plan out what I have heard others uh, call the three R's of uh, ca human capital development, that is recruitment, uh, recruiting and the right kind of young men and women for the right kind of job, including their aptitude, their training, their skill sets, and aligning them with, with the job that uh, they're wanting to do and able to do. Uh, and then not having the culture to uh, retain individuals that have you know, earned some leadership skills, some experience, and stay them and keep them in the system, not only because they could build upon that experience and leadership skill that they've gained, but more significantly, they would be there within the public service program to be examples for the young ones that are coming behind so that they have aspirations to be professionals uh, like them. And, and then the, the, the culture that, that is really lamentable is not, not having a culture of reward and, 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 and people there in the system. So this notion of retention, um, recruitment, retention, and reward, that culture is really not, not there. As a result, you don't have the kind of people and that would stay in the system, as David and others were mentioning earlier, 
to show to the world and to themselves and to their nations that there are opportunities within their own boundaries to be able to, to provide opportunities for, for the poor as well. Uh, institutionally, I think Africa's institutions have generally been woefully weak and sparse across the board from you know, education, research, and extension, uh, and as well as throughout the, you know, the, the wide range of impact pathway along the value chains, the policy issues, the regulatory issues that, we've been, we, we've, uh, that have been mentioned. And uh, while young men and women are being trained and not getting good education, and yet and the policy environment is not supportive of small businesses to develop locally or foreign direct investment coming from outside. So the net result has been that, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of us that have been involved in technical assistance program that donor agencies put in place uh, in the absence of all of these local uh, institutional uh, programs not developing a makeshift kind of arrangement that really doesn't have the interact the uh, in tr uh, the traction on the ground and sustainable, uh, the sustainability that is lacking. And so I think uh, as to the positive uh, development that have been mentioned, uh, I think maybe we can get back to, to see um, the opportunities that have come out from the last five, ten years of incredible development that have taken place in the continent. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's explore just uh, maybe with one more joint question before we open the floor. The, uh, how we connect young people back in, now you made some references to that in your answer, but uh, the last panel talked about young know, people in agriculture, but now let's, let's talk a little bit more about young people in R&D and extension uh, in, the, in the government in agriculture. How do we, how do we make the connection to uh, bring more young people into this process. How do we make it more interesting and, uh, and how do we, uh, and more compelling, I suppose, might be a better word. And, um, and, and as part of your answer, could you also address the issue of um, being sure to bring up women as well as men into this uh, whole uh, process? You know, one particular um, organization that have been created with uh, deliberately for this purpose, and I had the privilege of serving in that organization in, in founding it with the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. Um, and that Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, created this to provide this connection that, that have really been proven in, in places where it's given, been, been given a chance. And that is that you connect agricultural education with research, and, the, and then the results of research are taken out to the farm through the help of extension services and so on. This is the land uh, uh, grant mission and organization that have really been a great example, not only in its success in the United States, but as I said, everywhere that it has been given a chance. And, and part of the connection that was made deliberately in the AGRA program was to make sure that the connecting linkages are not left to chance, uh, but, but also built in into that program by developing agro dealership and seed industry development, and then making sure that working with the government, these technologies that have been generated in the research organization uh, are given the chance to connect through uh, these private sector uh, enhanced or complemented extension service type activities, working with um, shops in the rural communities carrying inputs like seeds and fertilizers and so on. Um, but while technically that has been really interconnected and, and, and worked very well, but the point that I'm making, why it has not really achieved as much gain as it could have been uh, is for this lack of internal local capacity and institutional strengthening that have been there. But even with that, in the last 20 years or so, and, and certainly the last 10 years since the creation of AGRA, the number of seed companies that have been created and, and, and providing input to, to the, the farmers have increased. And today, there are some 20% of farmers in Africa have improved seeds and fertilizers and, and making sure. And, and, and that has boosted yield. Uh, but again then, that this enabling environment that uh, William is mentioning 
the institutional capacity that are not there to function and instead in many places are continuing to be obstacle. And that is the one that I like to draw attention to in that, that there is a dialogue that is necessary between the donor communities and, and, and the donor, and donor governments and agencies as well as the national programs in many of these countries to really have uh, a heart-to-heart -heart dialogue in terms of what it is that the government is achieving and what kind of assistance they need from outside, what are the responsibilities for the national government to make sure that technology and innovations have a path for success to making a difference in the lives of people. So it's a, it's a story of, you know, um, uh, a glass half full, but, but there are some positive things happening. And again, maybe uh, I don't want to take all the time, but we'll get back to about the, uh, the gender agenda that, that uh, uh, an agenda that you, you, you certainly among the people that, that I know have, have been relentless about advancing that. And again, that is a glass full that is developing as well. That's the second. Second time we've heard the glass is half full, so two panels in a row, we'll keep it going. It was a family member that yes, said yes. that. <laughs> William. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, there is so much that has been said about uh, the youth, young people uh, being attracted to uh, not just agriculture, but, but, but many things, and, and how do we solve this? Now, you know, I'm fortunate enough uh, to have uh, three children who are young adults. Well, the first two are young adults, one is a teenager. And, uh, you know, I see the youth through them. And I, 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 you know, everything that I know about what the youth think, I see through, through my children. And one particular story stands out. Uh, my youngest son, when he was about 11, you know, wasn't doing particularly well in school, as 11-year-olds tend to do. And, uh, you know, my mother and I sat him down and said, look, you know, um, you're, you're not, you know, really trying as hard as you could. You know, your friend Tom is doing very well. He's your best friend. You know, why can't you be like Tom and, and perform like him? And he answered without thinking. He said, Tom has very clever parents. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that we know about uh, the youth today is that they don't want to be conventional. They don't want to do things like everybody else. I think that the one thing I do know if you ask, whenever I ask my kids, what do you want to be, you know, the, you know, in the old days they would say, I want to be a, 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 you know, a lawyer, accountant. You know, all they want to do is own their own business. They want to be entrepreneurs. I think that is, that is something that we should tap into. And I think, you know, uh, my sister asked about how redefining agriculture. Actually, I don't think it's redefining agriculture. I think the idea that you create a policy environment space where agriculture can be seen as a business you will not just attract young people, you will attract a lot of people uh, back to agriculture. Um, put the infrastructure in place so that you know, the, the, the produce can get to market. Uh, make uh, markets work. Again, you know, the, 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 the biggest challenge you have in agriculture with post-harvest loss, uh, as Andy was talking about, is you know, some of this produce just can't get to market because the infrastructure doesn't exist. Uh, it's produced, the productivity is up, they've had a good crop, but they have to throw it away because it couldn't get to the market. You know, markets don't function. And this is it's an important aspect of, of making uh, agriculture work. So I think thinking about agriculture as a business, creating that policy space and making it possible for people to actually look at it as a business, you know, you will attract young people uh, to, to, to that space. Does that require also the, the, uh, the government to consider agriculture like a business? Because I think it's sometimes the government just thinks, oh, farmers out there, they don't necessarily think business or entrepreneurial in that context. Oh, I, absolutely. I think, you know, the biggest impediment to the growth of the agricultural sector, in my view, um, has been, you know, government or lack of government uh, leadership on, uh, in this space. There is no sector that is more heavily regulated and uh, that is more affected by poor policies than agriculture. And the reason is that agriculture is a multi-sectoral, uh, you know, for agriculture to work, 
you need uh, not just the Ministry of Agriculture to, to be functioning and focused. You need the Ministry of Finance to ensure that you have the in investment. You need the Ministry of Infrastructure to ensure that the roads are there. You need the Ministry of Trade to ensure that you, know, you can have cross-border trade particularly, but also that agriculture is seen you know, as, a, as, as a business so that people can trade their markets where to take their produce. So you, you have to make sure that all these actors are acting together from a government perspective. And not all governments look at it like that, and that's the challenge. I think that you have some today who are beginning to look at agriculture in that way, and certainly CADAP, that framework that I spoke about, does require governments to take into account the multi-sectoral nature of, uh, of agriculture and ensure that they are, they are aligning their policies and more importantly, their investments uh, along those, those uh, multi-sectoral approaches. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, and um, uh, so our and the the one hand I see, oh, I see two more over here. Okay, is our speaker from just earlier? Right. I, let me ask everybody to make very brief uh, uh, questions so we can get as many in as possible. Sure, uh, William, you mentioned the idea of having smart parents, and I would suggest that part of the part of the issue is also having smart children. A lot of the children who've gone to the cities are now more technologically aware than their parents are. Are now, and also now have an awareness of the kind of lifestyle that they would like to take back with them to the, to the countryside. So part of what we're trying to do is to create the conditions under which they can live a modern lifestyle, but out in the rural areas. So the question, for, the question that I have for you is, is that if you're going to get governments, which are, tend to be unwieldy beasts, to focus on one area of policy, one, one, one policy initiative that you recommend governments do to try to make the new modern agriculture happen, what would you recommend? Great. William, would you like a minute to think yes. about that? Because I want to a a ask the other people, and then we can sure. uh, answer sure. the questions together. Was a hand in the middle up here? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Ruby. I'm an uh, agrologist and a faculty economic student. Um, my question is, and I'm really glad that you asked a question about the extension, because we talk a lot about uh, farmers and uh, entrepreneurs, food printers, uh, but we didn't talk much about the fact that they also have to be supported by extension. And we see data like 27% uh, of African youth study humanities and when 2% study agriculture. So I'm wondering, when we're talking a lot about building farms and having farmers, but not that much about the extension that are supporting them, uh, how do you see that going? Um, and how can we encourage much more people to actually study and maybe join extension and research in agriculture in the African continent as well? Good question. Thank you. There was another question in the back. Yes, sir. Thank you. And one more, and then we're f we'll finish with the question. We'll start with the answers. Um, I'm here. Joe Mwebaze from Auburn University. I'm also a colleague here at the um, My question is to get this up. Um, how do you suggest the youth should look at the GMOs? Because there is a lot of controversy. That's a good question. With, OK, so William's going to start since the first question was addressed to him. And, and uh, answer any that you'd like, please, and then we'll move to 
All right, thank you uh, very much, uh, um, Andy, for your question. Look, that's a tough one. Um, you know, wh where should governments focus on? And if I was, I had one answer, I think I would take the example of Ethiopia um, and uh, the creation of the uh, Commodities Exchange. You know, I fundamentally believe that the solution to uh, many of the agricultural problems that we have in, in the agricultural sector is, you know, to get agriculture working uh, commercially. So connecting smallholders to, to commercial value chains, um, you know, the thinking of agriculture as a business, I believe that the market can solve a lot of those problems. But the market is not going to be able to solve those problems if the market itself isn't working, if you don't create a platform for the market to work. And I think the way that the Ethiopian Commodities Exchange uh, has managed to do that, I mean, the idea that you know, if you thought about the US, for example, that a government would own a, a stock exchange or a commodity exchange, people think you're crazy. But in Ethiopia, it's worked. They set up this commodities exchange, and uh, today, um, you know, all the coffee in Ethiopia is today traded on, on, on the commodities exchange. It has increased in farmers' incomes um, significantly. And so I would say that to me, uh, and I'm not saying that commodities exchange is the only solution. But to me, if governments focused on making markets work for agricultural produce, I think that would be one sort of silver bullet that I think would solve a lot of uh, problems. I think I'll just talk about the, the, the rain-fed agriculture and the idea that, you know, the, you know, because rain is so important and agriculture is, is uh, it's a seasonal uh, business, I guess, uh, that uh, you know, it might be ch a challenge to think about it as a business. Well, I'll, I'll answer this way. You know, I worked for 20 years for the Coca-Cola company, um, doing business, really, you know, trying to build the business of, of selling Coke uh, in Africa, in many countries in Africa. And then I, I can assure you, every time it rained, you know, our sales went down. You know, <laughs> now you could plan for that a little bit because you know the rainy season, but this, the rain doesn't always follow the seasons. And uh, you know, in business, you plan for risks. Uh, and you price for risks. And so now I completely understand that for a smallholder farmer, planning for risks and, and pricing risks is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is not uh, you know, a, 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 as easy as that. But there are many solutions that are around. I think uh, Gibiza talked about Agra and the, the work they're doing around blended finance, where you're trying to look at solutions for smallholder farmers around mitigating risk. Okay, so some of those are things that could be done, but to me, I think unless, unless farming becomes profitable, unless it's something that can become a livelihood um, and can be seen as something that is a commercial activity, we, 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 will not, we will never solve some of the food security challenges, leave alone you know, the poverty and things challenges that we have uh, today. I'll let Gabiza. Uh, when, um, uh one thing that I, I would like African governments to do about the private sector is to recognize that government can't do it all. That there is a good division of labor. And there is a partnership, there's a complementarity. There is a role that there are things that the private sector can do better than the government. And there are also support services and an enabling environment that is a responsibility of the public system. To the extent that they develop better understanding and working together in the future, the society and communities are, are going to be better for it. This insincere, half-hearted commitment to private sector that is prevalent in Africa is really a major disease. And that as soon as they require, they, they begin to recognize that it is a partnership, that they can work together, but yes, uh, to the extent that they can watch out for concerns that they have, it is their right, they could do that. But, but in terms of you know, training nearly a million graduates a year in some countries and not employing 20% of them, and then if opportunities were there for local enterprises and outside foreign direct investment that would open up employment opportunities for gainful employment, the government is better, the country is better, society is better as a result of that. But that fear and suspicion that continues to exist and that half sincere commitment is really the huge bottleneck uh, from benefiting society at large with the good that would arise or could potentially arise from that. 
Um, in the question about extension, I think you know the recognition that agricultural systems change in agriculture. Uh, I think it was David that mentioned earlier are slightly different from changes in other systems, including health. The health system began to use an extension system way long after us, and they make it work, uh, you know, in many countries uh, very, very well. But the fact that in in agriculture, unlike health and other system, that you can't pull a magic bullet by giving a, a medicine or giving seed overnight to a farmer, but you need to be working with the farmer regularly and pro bring in feedback because there is another element that works with against us in, in agriculture, and that is a technology that is developed in any particular laboratory may or may not work in one environment as well as it did in other environments. So that lesson that uh, of processing that and working uh, with communities uh, slowly requires, yes, a blend of maybe private sector um, uh, motivated activities that may exist where opportunities lead that way, but a great deal of it is public service programs. There are now very many countries in Africa that have made the necessary inv investment, and as many of you know, as uh, young people, men and women, are assigned to the field of agriculture because extensions are usually not very well supported, very poor in infrastructure, and the, the last graduate in the lower tier of the graduating class is the one to be assigned to extension, and they're frustrated there because they can't do much, and, and so that needs to change. Ethiopia have made significant investment in extension service, trained 65,000 extension, extension agents, but at the same time, these extension agents are spread around the country. They're not very well supported. They're not connected to research. They're not making the kind of contribution that they would have made if they were you know, very well supported uh, to be effective in, in, in the task that they're assigned. The last question on, on GMO, I, I would like the young to appreciate that this is uh, a technology that has significant power in solving some problems that conventional science cannot cannot uh, address, and but it's not a, a magic bullet. It's not a particular product they need to be focused on, but it's the power of the science that is emerging. And so Africa needs to be investing in human capital development so they will learn more about the science. And then when they do that, uh, I think it was Euler that said in the earlier session that we don't need to be thinking about a technology, we don't need to be a supply side at that, and taking a technology and trying to find a problem that it could solve. I think it is a match that is necessary. You need to define the problem that you like to solve, and then what among the arsenals that you have in conventional science and biotechnology is the one that is likely to address that. When society begins to appreciate the, the science for what it is, and then the doors of opportunity would open up for the science. Thank you. Thank you. But if you can answer it in 30 seconds, because we have one, one minute left. Okay. To there, I think there was a question about multilateral investments in agriculture that uh, hasn't been answered. And I, it wasn't very clear to me what the question was. But I, I think I, I, I heard you say that, you know, um, we, we need solutions, as I talked about earlier, about a multi-sectoral uh, approach to agriculture. And you're absolutely right, of course. You know, the Ministry of uh, Finance needs to be increasing the amount of budget allocated to, to agriculture. The Ministry of Trade needs to make investments in ensuring that markets are working. You know, the Ministry of Infrastructure needs to be doing uh, work around creating roads and putting in place markets and, you know, those kind of things. So absolutely, yes, we should take a multilateral, multi-sectoral approach to, uh, to agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Visa and William for their thoughtful comments today. Thank you. And then a special thanks to all the speakers this afternoon and uh, to all of you for coming and participating. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing everybody tomorrow at the Ronald Reagan Building for the symposium. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Your kids don't know how influential they really are. If you, if you, if you, if you, you're, you're getting your guidance from your kids.